Okay, um, and good afternoon, just afternoon, excellent. So, um, uh, welcome to another head talk. We're going to talk about Agile. Um, um, specifically, agility does not equal speed. Uh, my favorite, I did a version of this talk a number of years ago, and it, my favorite thing about that, um, it was in Amsterdam, is that somebody had gone and carefully put the sign, the name of the talk, on screens all around the conference center. But had not put not equals, had put equals. <laughs> the exact opposite message, which I thought was great. I took a photograph of it uh, and occasionally use that. Um, I want to talk because that is a common perception. It's, a, it's an easy one to make. Um, so, my name's Kevlin Henney, and there was a time when I just used to put my social details on the opening slide, but in the balkanization of social media, um, I'm now everywhere and nowhere. So I'll put them all on a separate slide. Um, you can find me in most places. Um, I don't tend, to, I, mean, I do check in on all of this stuff. I don't tend to be as active as I used to be. Um, normally it means that I'm supposed to be doing something else. Um, so, uh, but yeah, you can find me in most places. And the reason I'm pointing that out is should the killer question, we will have time for Q&A at the end. If the killer question pops into your head after I've walked out the door, or if you're watching this online, the killer question pops into your head whilst we're doing this. And it's a case of like, ah, I need to get in touch with Kevin to ask him this, uh, or what did you mean when you said? Um, here's how to find me. Um, so, I did this thing a few years ago. Um, edited 97 Things Every Program Should Know. And we're not strictly just talking about programming today, so that's not particularly relevant. We were just talking just before this started about the pandemic. This is a book Trisha G and I produced uh, finalised during the first wave of lockdowns. Um, 97 things every Java program should know. Um, I do a lot of work with people working with code, but also more to the point, um, considering architecture and living within an architecture. I'm a very strong believer about this idea that we don't use the architecture metaphor deeply enough. Architecture defines a space where you live and work. We tend to just talk about it in terms of structures and technologies. The system you're working on, what does that feel like? What is the architecture like as a lived-in experience? When you look at it like that, it completely changes your perspective. But importantly, the idea, although I'm not talking about patterns today, I want to put, highlight a connection here. Because with patterns, what we're trying to do is understand what works and what doesn't. The whole purpose of a pattern is not the way that many people think of it, is the idea of what, what is actually working for us. Let's experiment. The whole idea of patterns was an empirical approach to trying to build something. Let's try something. How's that working out? Yeah, not so good. Yeah, oh, that's great. Let's do more of it. And that is not just about software structure, but also about the way that we work. Uh, indeed, when we talk about agile development, the whole agile movement exists. The core of the agile movement, I want to distinguish different aspects of the agile movement. It's, uh, there's lots of parts to it. The core of the agile movement came from the patterns community. The original ideas were laid down uh, and documented as patterns. Here are ways in which teams and companies and individuals um, work effectively. And this is why they work and this is why they don't work. Here's the trade-offs to consider. Have you tried this if this is not working? And that was where that, that came from. So it was, a, it was a much deeper dialogue with the situation. It was not about certification. I'm going to say that up front. Um, so let's, let's look at this word. Um, for a definition of Agile, and there's certainly plenty online, I'm going to ignore all of those ones online. I'm going to go and seek out the comfort of a dictionary. Um, it's an adjective, which is kind of important. We kind of overlooked that. What does it mean to be, for something to be an adjective? It means it describes something. It's a property of something. Okay? It's not a thing. It's a property of a thing. I mean, obviously, we can get very philosophical and say even properties are things, but we're not going to have that conversation. It's just the wrong time of day. But it's a description of a thing. We say, when we talk about Agile, it's not some kind of absolute. It's not a thing that you do. You don't, you know, so I guess this is, I feel slightly, slightly, slightly curious. I am colorblind, but I do believe this is green. Um, you feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I'm working under the belief that this is green. And... So green is not a, this is not a thing that you do. Gold on this is not a thing that you do. It's a description of the thing that is. So when we look at a team, we say, oh, yeah, they're agile. It's not they're doing agile, that they are. But it also comes in degrees. 
That team is more agile than that team. That team is more agile than they were three months ago. In other words, we can do that. We can offer a description. And what are we saying when we say that? We're saying that they're able to move quickly and easily. Yeah, actually, this works really well with code. All those other definitions of agile development seem surprisingly long-winded. Um, however, it turns out there's a lot of companies doing agile. And it's, it's a noun. We are doing agile. And what does that involve? A lot of quick movement. And in fact, busyness. There are a lot of people being incredibly busy. And this, this is a problem. It, is, it has ended up with um, the problem of people kind of hitting burnout sooner it's, um, uh, in certain cases. It has led to the opposite of what was intended, where the original vision of Agile was um, stand back. What is it that I can do to help developers um, create the products, what is it we can do to help the products evolve? It's now, what can I do to micromanage everything uh, over the top and in an exhausting fashion? Uh, I visited a company in Belfast a few years ago and they'd tried Agile and stopped. And I said, why? Well, we were just exhausted. I was talking to the project managers. What they had done is they'd taken all of their project management experience and then just turned the dials up to 11. They said, we were just doing everything that we were already doing more frequently. It's just like, yeah, that, don't do that. Yeah? It is, you have to unlearn. But that all ties up with this cult of busyness and this cult of speed. Um, so this particular engineering slogan, Move Fast and Break Things, was popularized in recent years by Facebook. Um, but I want to point out that it's not a Facebook invention, that term. It dates back to the 1950s, and it is an engineering term. It's an engineering term. Um, yeah, move fast and break things like you know, democracy, um, social institutions, uh, and stuff like that. The, the thing is, this, is, this sounds like, this sounds really bold. It's the kind of thing you put on a, a startup, um, you know, on a poster and hang it up in a startup, and everyone feels strangely motivated. The um, thing is, that's not really how you do long term software development, it's not how you get good products. You want to move slow and mend things. Okay? Yeah, sure, there's, there's stuff you need to mess about with. Fine, understand the bits that you are messing about with. But product development is actually much more circumspect. Again, it's mostly about stepping back and going, Wait a minute, what's really going on here? It's not about rushing in. You know, fools rush in and all the rest of it. We have loads of sayings around that. Um, so there's a kind of an art to slowness that is, is being lost. Um, and many people have mistaken agile for being speed. And that important thing, as I mentioned back with, um, with this, quick movement. Notice the easily got lost. It's too complex, two things. Just one job people want, okay, we'll do, we'll do the quick bit. It actually turns out the easily, are we able to do this with ease? Is it comfortable? Is it getting better? Is this okay? It's a very simple question, but it got thrown away because it's surprisingly hard to measure. Whereas apparently quick movement and busyness is very easy to measure. You know, be careful what you know. Be careful what you wish for, and be careful what you measure. It's not just that you get what you measure. The danger is that you only get what you measure. So there's a whole idea here that is very, very different, and it some of it hinges on language. Uh, and you'll notice actually in this talk, as in, uh, I I have a mild obsession with language and communication because I think that that's how we get ideas into other people's heads. Um, and it also shapes and colors our ideas very strongly. Let's talk about these words fast. So um, most of the time, I won't pick anybody up about their use of the word fast. Occasionally, I do. Um, but I don't do it with, with annoying pedantry, just for clarification. Uh, there are books I love that have uh, and, and talks and articles that I love where somebody has talked about develop better software faster. Yeah, there's a really nice one in. Um, uh, 97 Things Every Java, program, uh, Every Java Program Show by Marit van Dyke, and she talks about delivering better software faster. Okay? Uh, Modern Software Engineering by Dave Farley. He talks about you know, basically doing things faster. That is his language. That's absolutely fine because he lays out the case very, very clearly, likewise Marit does. But if it's just offered as a soundbite, we need to develop faster, then it becomes dangerous because you're not offering people context. Deliver sooner, not faster. Pause for a moment and think, hang on, what is the objective of this? Are we just trying to be busier or are we trying to just arrive somewhere sooner? So 
not only am I a bit colorblind, I also have a staggeringly poor sense of direction. Um, you know, sat navs were my salvation, with the possible exception of coming to Cornwall. Um, uh, as I was reminded yesterday when I drove in, and uh, also half a dozen instructions that I've seen going through, oh yeah, ignore the sat nav, follow this road. It's just, oh, okay, right. Um, I have a very poor sense of, my, uh, of direction. My wife has a very good sense of direction. And uh, we don't run these experiments anymore. I mean, they were never intentional experiments. But when the kids were younger, there'd be cases like where we were both out doing something and then we would arrange to meet up somewhere. We'd have a respective child who'd been taken to one kid's party and buying the other child's shoes or something like that. We'd rendezvous for a coffee and an ice cream or something like that. And then we'd go home. But at this point, we have two parents, two children, two cars. Who's going to get home first? The, kids that back, the, ki the child that backed dad was always the loser. Okay? Now, who drove faster? Me. I used to have the speeding points to prove it. Yeah? <laughs> who got home sooner? My wife. That is the difference between these two things. My wife had an understanding of the route. She understood what to do when there was an obstacle. She would say, oh, there's another shortcut I can take. She had a good understanding of the whole and was able to navigate it. Me, I'm just, I'm just driving around twice as far, twice as fast, and turning up much later. There's a lot of software development that looks like the latter. Okay? We want to be aiming for sooner. And again, this is about, I don't know, um, you know there's, there's, there's the slow food movement. I kind of keep thinking we need that in software because most of the stuff that we do is actually just noise and busyness. And if we just slow down a little bit more, we'd actually find the right speed. So, again, Notice the language keeps, populates the language of Agile. Notice this word, velocity. A lot of teams measure velocity. Now, I don't think it would be a bad thing if they did. But I'm going to, this is the bit where I get pedantic about words. Um, somewhere in my past, I have a degree in physics. And there is, given we're in a technical domain, we should probably respect the technical version and the precise version of this word. Because if we draw stuff out, velocity is something that has magnitude, it's a vector, and it has direction. What most teams are measuring and discussing when they say velocity, they're talking about speed, which is actually different. And it, it deserves our respect and attention, this distinction in the words. We are measuring speed. I'm very good at speed. Kevlin, which way are you going? I'm heading 70 miles per hour. Well, yeah, but which direction? North, you need to be going south. I've had that call. Yeah, the point there is that going at great speed in the wrong direction is not a virtue. I'd have been better off walking. The point there is that we have, and again, just be careful what you measure. We have teams answering what is potentially a complex question. What's your progress? That is a complex question. Or well, it's a simple question with a complex answer. We've got them answering it with one figure. And it might come out in story points, it might come out in whatever, but we're kind of trying to squeeze everything into this one figure. And it's not doing, it's not doing, it's not rewarding the right behavior. It's not sending us in the right, uh, right direction, literally. So what, what we mean by direction in, in a software sense? I would say, you know, it's, it's the old ones, doing the right thing in the right way. Are we building the right product according to what we know from our product owner, customer, feedback, however we look at it. Are we building it in the right way? That's obviously a little more subtle. But it turns out that we're incredibly good at building it in the wrong way and noticing we're getting great speed. This is amazing, the speed we get. Yeah, but we are building crap, you know. But also we're, and this is, and then it gets more complex and we have to give up the, the physics metaphor a bit, uh, metaphor a bit, because we can, end up, um, we can end up getting in our own way. There is a distinction um, that the systems thinker John Seddon um, makes when we are talking about the reason that somebody is working. Let's, let's just call the reason I am working on something, let's call that demand. Okay? As in the classic supply and demand. His language is coloured by that. So the classic idea, why am I doing this? Why are you working on this piece of code? And he distinguishes two categories. 
Of course, in reality, we could probably distinguish others, but for, for the purposes here, he distinguishes failure demand and value demand. I am working on this because this is actually adding a feature that somebody wants to the product. This line of code here now does something with the database that didn't happen before, and now you, you can experience that. Here I have put a button, and you can experience that as a user. You press this, thing happens. Thing that you could not do before, and it is of value to you. That's value demand. And then there's the other one, failure demand. I am doing this because we have a problem. Does this work add any value to the product? Absolutely none whatsoever. But we need to do it because otherwise we don't really have a product or we are perceived as sliding backwards. The obvious one in this case is bugs. Do they add value to a product? No. <sighs> well, you, you couldn't, I've seen people try and make a case for this. Here is, here is the product. This is the product with defects. Therefore, when you fix a defect, you add value. But that's a bit like saying you're a meter underwater. When you rise a meter to the surface, you're flying. No, you're not. That, that's, that's just called coming up to the right level so you can breathe. Adding, fixing defects is not the same as adding features. There's a lot of variability in it. It's, it's basically things that should have been, but weren't. Now, I'm not saying we should, um, that we're not going to punish anybody for uh, a defect, but we need to understand where did they come from. What is the situation that created these? And often we find it's often to do with busyness, that we are not able to slow down and take a sense of the whole. Or, yeah, that test that I didn't have time to write with hindsight, we're really bad at hindsight. We're very, very bad at saying, that thing I've experienced this week is related to something I didn't do six months ago. That's just not a human skill. We're very, very poor at that. But there is a simple idea here that trying to understand the, the right thing in the right way and look at this idea of failure demand. Failure demand is a very helpful thing when it comes to not just defects, but the more subtle things. Um, I'll give you, oh, actually, I will give you another defect example. Uh, so I'm based in Bristol. A few years ago, visited a company just outside Bristol. I want to give you a set. Uh, it, was for, it was for an agile health check, OK? OK? And the great thing is that sometimes you get your answer before you even set through the door. Uh, was it? I met the guy in April at a user group meeting and he said, oh, didn't know you were based in Bristol. Could you just come in for a day or two just to, you know, just to kind of have a look at what we're doing and just, you know, I said, yeah, sure. Um, that's fine. You're just up the road. That's quite, quite easy for me. You're about a 20 minute drive from my house. That's fine. Um, and I said, at the moment, it's really good because, you know, the kids are on holiday and all the rest of it. And I said, you know, school holidays, that, that, that can work. You know, all those other half terms coming up because um, I'm traveling otherwise. They got back to me. We arranged the days for August. It took from April to August to organize one day for a company locally. You can already get, you already, you know, to the, to, the question, to the question, how agile are they? You already know the answer, okay? It's not just individual teams, it's the whole organization. And when I went in there, absolutely fascinating some of the thing, things that they'd done. Um, Obviously, you don't know you're doing these things when you're in the middle of it. Um, but I have had somebody once say, oh, no, we need to watch out that we're not going to be in the middle of a Kevlin Henney story. Uh, normally, you don't know you're in the middle of these things. That's the whole point. It's only when you step back and you go, hindsight tells me that was quite weird. They had some real problems. They had a whole load of bugs, lots of bugs. That was plaguing their development. Software quality was getting in their way, getting in the way of their releases and everything. So what they did is they set up a kind of tiger team to kind of like, Kill the bugs. Not necessarily a bad solution. If you need to do something, you know, to bring the situation under control. However, that seemed to work out well enough that they said we're going to keep the Tiger team permanent. That's the problem. You've now you're now specialising a team for fixing bugs, and there's no feedback loop to the people that created them. But not only are we going to do that. We've got some spare capacity in Peterborough, so we'll have a team in Peterborough fixing the bugs, and we'll have a team in Bristol creating them. There's about a three and a half hour drive between them. And what was fantastic is that both teams did well. Because they are, you know, when you, it's only when you stand back and look at the system and say, wait a minute, we've just set up a whole team for failure demand. That whole team only exists because these guys are getting better at producing bugs. And these guys are getting really good at fixing them, but 
We're never achieving the kind of the root, we're never addressing the root cause. But we've got a whole team of people there to fix it. And we actually see it. When you start looking at, and when you understand failure demand from that point, you go, oh, yeah. Failure demand is how long do you spend looking at the code when you, come to uh, when you come to add something? It's not just about fixing bugs. It's how long is it when I'm looking at it going like, okay, I, know I need to add a feature. I'm sure it's somewhere here in this 10,000 line class, but I'm not entirely sure where. I don't fully understand what I'm looking at. That's failure demand. That's, that's you sitting there, I have to spend time trying to figure this thing out. It's, there's a slow start to everything. All of that stuff constitutes failure demand. It's those are the delays. If we look at it from a lean perspective, that's, that becomes really important. And so that's, and the, the thing is, it's not impossible to measure if you want to measure it. It's just you need to be a little more sensitive and broad in your thinking of what is it we're looking at? How is it we are defining the right direction? But let's keep it simple. Um, so, uh, so, unless you're actually doing physics or, or maths at the moment, then let's keep it simple. Um, velocity or speed. Speed is difference in space over difference in time. Okay, that seems to be quite, that seems to be quite, quite nice. And then let's just draw this as a burn down chart. The idealized burn down chart many people are presented with. I, I was certainly presented with these in um, all the early scrum literature from kind of like late 90s onwards. And there's your burn down chart. There's a whole load of stuff, S is for stuff, that we need to do. And time passes. And the idea is that's your ideal burn down chart. I, I, I remember starting to question the idea that this is ideal because often what happens is that if it's a product, product management is not project management. So if this is the product backlog, then it should never be empty because when you've run out of things to do, effectively your product is dead. Yeah? Um, uh, project management is about having an end goal. It's about working towards it. So it's a finite game. Our goal is to do this and then we are done. That is what a project is. In software, we have misused that word massively. It's really interesting going to other disciplines where they still use the word project in its original sense. And they will say, oh, project-based work. In other words, it's, it has a fixed objective. Ideally, they probably want to do it in a fixed time, but the idea of there is, a, there is an end point. That is your success. That's, not, that's, that's very much not the case for software development. We don't have an end point. A product is, the product's end is when we retire it. The whole point of the game, so it's often called, it's referred to as an infinite game, the whole point of the game is to keep on playing the game, is to actually not finish it. The goal, you never finish your software until it's done and sunset and that's it. The idea is there should always be, which means the whole way of playing the game has got to be fundamentally different. And so therefore, project management tactics and techniques are actually toxic to products, which is kind of an interesting thing because we've been borrowing the vocabulary and then rediscovering product development in recent years. But we had this idea of this burn down. Why is it called a burn down chart? This, is, this was an interesting one. Um, <laughs> Turns out the term comes from Jeff Sutherland, uh, co basically the creator of Scrum. And he used to be a, um, if I recall correctly, he was a, uh, uh, he was a fighter pilot for the US Navy. And um, he flew Phantoms. And if you are landing on an aircraft carrier, it turns out you have a finite amount of space that you have to really care about deeply. Okay, otherwise you are in the water. And it turns out that, that this is what they called the approach path, it was the burn down. You had a burn down chart. This is, these are the angles and the points. You should be at various points. So he just said, oh, it looks like a burn down chart. So that's why we call it a burn down chart. Which is kind of interesting because unfortunately people have taken the vocabulary and inverted it. Here's this, you know, because um, I think it's also very helpful not just to look at what, what we've got left, but how much have we done. Psychologically knowing what you've done is also very helpful. And that's just a general thing. People have a to-do list. I've come across ideas that, you know, help your state of mind by saying you should also look at what you've done because sometimes you can reach the end of the day and say my to-do list is still full I don't feel I've done anything actually keep a separate list going oh actually I've done quite a lot but the situation was dynamic and you know uh, it turns out that everything that was originally on there has now shifted in priority I used to call this a build-up chart in fact I still do because you're building up a lot of people call it burn up because it's the opposite of burn down except I also have an interest in space flight and burning up is very very bad <laughs> And likewise, when around the time that Scrum started becoming popular, my kids were little and, yeah, burning up, fever, that's not good. 
Um, I remember the other pandemic in 2003 in Hong Kong, where I took my son, um, and he was burning up at that point and was picked out by the infrared cameras. Um, nothing, nothing too problematic. They just said, yeah, he's burning up because he's a child and they just catch everything. Um, but burn up, not the right word, but let's look at this point of view. Let's actually understand what is it that we have built. And then we have to start labeling axes because this is one of those things that people get told when they do any STEM subject, you've got to say what the units are. You can't just say five. How, how big is that five? What, apples, meters, light years, what are we talking about here? You know, is this, is this mass, is this, uh, is this time, is this, but this is some kind of time dimension. Time is in time, cool. The question is what's S? And this is where it kind of gets interesting. One of the most common interpretations of what are we going to be measuring is story points. How many story points have we effectively um, implemented in the last sprint, the last day, the last quarter, whichever time frame we want to choose? The problem is that story points, in practice, regardless of what their original intention was, in practice, they're a measurement of time. Now, I remember pointing this one out, and it hadn't occurred to me until I was shown, the Scrum Master very proudly showed me hand-drawn charts. There's a lot to be said for hand-drawn charts. You know, definitely you know, get physical with stuff. As a human being, we are very physical creatures, and we relate to stuff. But he <laughs> took great pride in adjusting the diagram every day. And I started talking, I was like, wait a minute, hang on, this doesn't feel right. You're measuring time against time. You're not actually measuring software productivity. You're not measuring what the customer is getting. You're measuring time against time. And what does that mean? Well, utilization is one thing that it means. How much of your time, you know, we originally planned, you know, I, I say, oh, I'm, you know, this is a five-day task, and in a given week, I devote three, uh, three days to that task. Then uh, from a practical point of view of, of uh, a project work from that perspective, I've got 60% utilization. The other 40% is, I don't know, meetings or being a team leader or something like that. I realized this when, uh, years ago when I became a team leader, I suddenly realized my utilization had dropped. The proportion that I was spending on code itself and the system dropped from just being a senior, de a senior developer. Okay, that's an observation. It's neither good nor bad. It's just like, oh yeah, there we are. But that's what time against time means. Or it's a measure of the quality of your estimations against your actuals. Okay, um, in other words, <laughs> we estimated five days, but whoops, it was ten. Okay, um, and that can have some value. Again, we can't predict the future. We'll come on to that in a moment. But the point, that, that's what, these are the, th the interpretations of time against time. Does it measure how good our software development is? Not even close. It's, not, it's measuring something completely different. Okay, let's try again. Let's go back to stuff. The simplest definition of stuff that we could possibly have, and this is one of those dangers where we go, what is it, what the, we need to measure something. Desperately, we need to measure something. Okay, let's measure stuff like, I don't know, thousands of lines of code. And yeah, that one doesn't work out so well. Um, it turns out that, you know, um, this, is a, uh, this, is, this is not something that can, will help you. It turns out that some developers write code more ver verbosely than others. Um, I have seen the code that is high productivity, and I have simplified the code that is high productivity, and I have achieved negative productivity in a number of environments and in a number of situations. And the problem is, if that's your measure, you will, you know, you're not again encouraging good stuff. Um, years ago, with a, a client I visited, near the inception of their project, um, and actually they, they they moved from project to product thinking, in all fairness, um, but near the inception of the development, and at that point they had 50,000 lines of code. And it was uh, an infrastructure, middleware related code. And this was performance related, it was developed in C. Developers, relatively new to C, but very much a strong C background. Um, but also, they worked on different platforms. And so they had very different ideas about how to do stuff. And so I was in there to try and help them with stuff. That's great. Three months later, I return. Department, department head says, I'm a little bit concerned, Kevin. I said, why? Well, Productivity seems to have dropped. I said, well, why? He said, well, you know, when you visited three months ago, there was 50,000 lines of code. 
for you, you know, and, then, and the number was going up. And then you visited, and it flatlined. Cause, effect. And I said, oh, OK, that probably means they've been taking some of the advice and applying it. And he kind of looked a bit disturbed. And I said, well, hang on. How, what are the bugs doing? Oh, they're going down. OK. What about, uh, what about what you're doing in the backlog? In other words, what you're achieving. Oh, yeah, we've got through the functionality. And I said, right, look at those. What's actually happened is that they, if they had not been doing feature-related work, the, it would have been even worse. The number would have gone down. Because what they were able to do was more with less. They realized that the techniques that they were using, sometimes it was a lack of knowledge with the techniques uh, and facilities available in the language and, uh, and the environment around them. And they've just got better at doing that. And there's less that can have bugs, curiously enough. Yeah? Um, so we need to be very, very careful. So that's not to say that lines of code is not a good measure. A lot of people come out against it. Oh, no. Lines of code is the most accurate measure of the number of lines of code you have. <laughs> there is no other substitute that even comes close. And I do sometimes ask teams that because it's an awareness issue. Because it also tells you how much stuff they've got. There is a very big difference. So this team eventually, well, we hit 100,000 lines over a number of years. They were an absolute runaway success as a team. They really matured. They really got, they, they did all the good stuff. They changed their own practices. They adapted their own practices. Another team, a few partitions away, same company, one million lines of code. And it took me a while, a while working with these guys to work out, you've got the same amount of functionality as those guys. It wasn't doing the same thing, but if you were to compare, you know, if you were to write everything up and use stories, use traditional techniques like function points, the two systems were about the same size in what they did. Yet one was an order of magnitude larger in terms of the lines of code. And that tells you the lived experience of the developers on a day-to-day -day basis. You, know, you can tell who went home on time, and you can tell the people that were firefighting. Because you come in, the building's on fire, and it's a very big building. And the best you can do is hope to put out one fire, hopefully not dragging around the fire cause behind you. you know, it's just like, but, but that was the thing. They were just battling sheer scale. And, and the lack of knowledge, the number of developers diluted across the whole system. So we need to be very careful with this. It is a valuable measure because it shows you, do you know how big your system is? But also, how much stuff do we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? But as a measure of... Productivity is not very good. It's worth knowing what happens to that measure over time, but you have to correlate it with something else. Maybe the number of lines of code is correlated with increasing in functionality. There are periods where that's very, very clear. But notice I'm saying that periods, you've got to be more sensitive to this to kind of understand, oh, yeah. It's like, you know, in your own life, you may notice that your weight has changed. Um, and sometimes it correlates with things like growing up. Disappointingly, after growing up, it can still go up. And we call those moments things like Christmas and stuff like that. We have names for them. But the point there is that the meaning of that, anybody with kids will know you're supposed to weigh them every now and then, and you know, there's healthy, which percentile they are for their, all the rest of it. That changes when you hear adulthood. But it's still a measure. It just means something different. And that's the thing you need to do with uh, when you look at a software system. You say, oh, OK, number of lines of code's gone up, but Hey, guess what? Says so the number of bugs, but the functionality seems to have tailed off in terms of our progress on a weekly basis. That's not so good. I wonder what else is going on. In other words, a good metric is not an answer. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to find out what the answer is. It's a question. Then we use this other term, value. Yeah, I'm going to come to value. Because what does that mean? We said, well, the idea is that over time we're increasing the amount of value. So let's be very careful with this word, um, because it means different things to different people, and people do like to talk about business value. I love this uh, Tom Toro cartoon from 2015. Uh, yes, the planet got destroyed, but, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So when we talk about value, and particularly that phrase business value, which gets thrown around, value for whom? Is it value for the shareholders? Is it value for the customer? Is it value for your organization? Is it value for your team? Is it value for you? These are all value, but they have different answers. Likewise, what time frame is it over? Is it value over the next week versus value over the next month, quarter, year? Again, these are all, they, these will yield different answers. Um, so, uh, simple question, 
we can think about, for example, what's the business value of uh, SMS at the moment if you're a telecoms company? Not a lot, is it? People don't really use SMS the way they used to. There's a whole generation of people that grew up on SMS. And being, uh, being older than that generation, I remember going into, going into phone stores and being offered gazillions of free texts per month. And it's just like, honestly, do I look that young? I mean, thank you, but no. I, you know, uh, it's just, um, you know, kids used to burn through thousands of texts a month. That was a valuable offer. These days, you couldn't give the stuff away because we're using thousands of other messaging systems. Everything has a messaging system. Does that mean that SMS is not valuable? Yes, that's true now. But if I were making that forecast in 1995, I'd be missing out the fact that there was a huge period of value. So you need to understand what's the window over which you're asking value. And to whom? I remember once making a decision that saved the customer two weeks of development time. It turned out I could develop it in half a day if we just made a small twist and an assumption and that they, they didn't need a database solution. They could use their file system. They didn't need to be locked into our product. They could use any product. I think that's a really good solution. My boss was not so impressed. Okay? Now, was that good or oh, I saved the customer two weeks of work. I saved me two weeks of database work I didn't want to do. I mean, the value for me and the customer, for my boss and his perception from the point of view of the organization we work for, not so much. So it's not that we can't have a definition for business value, but be very wary of anybody that just says, we're doing this for business value, and they don't give you a definition for that. Here's what I mean. This is the time frame over which we will observe this, and this is for whom this is valuable. And, and that, that's, that's, that's the notion there. Once you've got that, it's going, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And you can contest that, but the point is now you can actually do something with it. So that deals with this. But then there's another little phrase that we find, and it's littered all through agile literature, a lot of stuff on Scrum, um, prioritized by business value. And initially, this sounds really good. Okay, it's one of those kind of like nice things that, you know, it's just like you... Here's the top 10 things we do. We prioritize um, the work that we do based on business value. And that sounds absolutely laudable. It's a very positive sounding thing. But there's a small problem with this. You can't do it. And I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I mean, I, mean, I mean you can't, as in laws of physics can't. Because you don't know the business value of something for all the reasons I've just described, because the business value of something will only be known in the future. Okay? And if you know the future, wow, that's a really awesome skill. Um, what are you doing in software development? Why are you not out having fun and traveling time like a time lord? Because the point is you don't know the future. Okay? The best you can ever do is prioritize by estimated business value. But you cannot prioritize by business value. That doesn't, that, that's, that's against the laws of physics as we understand them. Okay? And if you think, well, Kevin, it's just one word, then you and I need to have a really deep discussion about the difference between actuals and estimates. Do not confuse one with the other. This is a really important idea because it also offers us a bit of humility because it tells us we can be wrong. Yeah? There's variation in estimates. That's, they're, they're probabilities. They're not certainties. How good are we at predicting the future? Well... There's this classic quote, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. What I love about this quote is we don't know who said it. Now, why would I love that? Because it was said in the past. That tells you how much we know about the past. We don't know very much about the past. It, this was likely said in the last 100 years. I like to think it was Niels Bohr, the quantum physicist, because it's so cool, that, that ties up with quantum uncertainty. This is fantastic. One of the books I co-authored... Um, we ended up using this quote, but it was attributed to Yogi Berra, baseball legend, because it's, it's a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a, it's got this kind of quippish, contradictory aspect that he was famous for, um, and that's the thing about writing, co-authoring a book. When you have three authors, you never have a dead heat, and I lost that one. However, I was able to then use it in another book where I then attributed it to Niels Bohr. Yeah, but the thing is, we don't actually know, and that's the past. Which also gives us another point when we start talking about how we deal with the work that we are going to be looking at. Given we're talking about driving and speed, here's a roadmap that actually looks like a roadmap. Now, this is a metaphor we have come to love a great deal. And 
It's a little bit like velocity. We keep talking about velocity, and I think it would be great if we did actually talk about velocity. I think that would be valuable, but we only end up talking about speed. I think the roadmap metaphor is potentially very rich. But the problem is, well, it kind of became obvious to me a few years ago, and then sitting there at the beginning of the pandemic, early lockdown phase, you know, Google is your friend, or your enemy, depending on what you're looking for, you know, um, and I just thought, oh, there must be templates for this. Google, roadmap, PowerPoint, templates. Oh, my goodness, there are loads. And half of them look something like this. They have a road on them, and it's very pretty. And they kind of show you, you know, it's kind of, oh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so you can go and put your stuff there. That's great. And it, it, it kind of makes your presentation look perhaps a little bit cooler. I'm not going to say it will, but, you know, th that's the idea. So that's a roadmap. So is this. Uh, this is Bristol. I live just about, uh, about that far off the top of the A38 there. Now, when you look at this, you realise there's quite a big difference between these two. Namely, the number of roads. Why would you need a map for a road map, or for a route that only has one road? You don't need a map, you need an itinerary. That's all you need. The point, the point is, there is no point in having a map if there's only one road on it. I remember staying on a Scottish island a few years ago, my wife, and she was sort of said each morning, because remember I have poor sense of direction, I'd be sitting there with a the sat nav, working out where we're going to go today, and she says, why are you doing that? There's one road around the island. You go that way, or you go that way, and the, the causeway to main, the, the mainland is over that way, and you can see it from here. You know, it's quite simple, really. You don't need a map. She was right. And that's the point. You don't need a map here. But a roadmap is potentially very powerful because it gives you possibilities. That's the value. That's the value of the metaphor. And just as I've been driving down yesterday, and, um, and I, was, uh, I, I drove around this morning, it shows you possibilities. It's dynamic. Modern maps are cool because they say, oh, you could take this route and it'll be the same... It'll take the same amount of time. Estimate it. Very careful. Similar ETA is what Google Maps says. It doesn't say it will be the same time. Estimated time of arrival. That word estimate is really important. It says similar ETA. Or this route is seven minutes slower. Now, think about that from a software point of view. How much do you know about exactly what's going to happen in the next month, next two months, next three months? Do you know that all the technical decisions you have taken are going to work out? Do you know the complexity of something that you have just taken on, that the customer has requested? Perhaps it's something that's legislative related. If it's new legislation, then nobody really understands it. So we're all learning together. If we've not built it before, then we've not built it before. We don't know exactly what's involved. We know approximately what's involved, but there might be subtleties we're not aware of, misinterpretations. There may be issues with framework decisions that we have taken, we said, oh, this is going to make our life easier. I saw the demo. It looked really good. I saw the talk. Yeah, it's fantastic. And now we're actually using it. It's just like, you know what? There's a mismatch between what might be considered the, the kind of the comfort zone of this framework and what we're actually trying to do. We're kind of operating at the edges. And then actually, it's going to be a little more awkward for us than we anticipated. You know, the idea is not that you can predict the future, but that you accommodate the fact that, you know what? There's a lot of different roads. There might be there might be obstacles, and we may not know them until we arrive. We want to know that there are other things. So the reason we use a roadmap is to know that there's more than one way to get somewhere. So next time somebody says, here's the roadmap for our product, here's the roadmap for our software architecture, put your hand up and ask where the other roads are if there's only one possibility of the future. Yeah? Just as a reminder, remember when I, when I searched this in 2020, this one came up. It was obviously done in 2018. Here we are in 2023. How many people predicted there'd be a global pandemic that changed the very nature of work and the impact on their company and their customers and, in fact, everything in 2020? Nobody? Exactly. Yeah, that's how good we are at predicting the future. So the point here is this is not the way, that, this is not the, way the future unfolds. It tells us also about our design process. So for this, I'm going to do a bit of time travel to a past that I do know exists. 1968. This is a classic. Um, oh, it's, it's a classic piece of uh, 1960s um, uh, fontage as well. That's uh, Gil Sans 
font. It's beautifully, it's the same year and typeface that was used for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I'm not sure if that's valuable to you, but it's certainly valuable to me. They're just to highlight the notion of value. This is, so this is kind of what people were thinking back in 1968. It was kind of a sample of what we believe software engineering to be. The design process is an iterative one. Andy Kinsler. This comes as a big surprise to a lot of people who think that in 1968 everybody was going to be plan driven. That we know everything that's going to happen. No, there's a whole load of stuff in this document that, from people saying, yeah, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's plans we'd like to have, but then there's a lot of things we don't know. We need to iterate. This is not news. Okay? Um, the observation is that as you're building stuff, to borrow a quote from my favorite, one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman, you have to finish things. That's what you learn from. I used the term learn before. When you are developing software, unlike manufacturing, manufacturing is about the creation of identical or near identical artifacts. You are trying to eliminate variation. That is the goal of that. Okay. Um, so here is an empty coffee cup. And um, there's another empty coffee cup there. I'm sure if we go to the canteen, there'll be a lot that look exactly like this. These were manufactured. The goal of manufacturing is the elimination of variation. The goal of software, that, well, by, so just as a clarification, and this was observed in 1968, software is uniquely unlike manufacturing. Software development is not like it, so we need to be cautious with some of our metaphors. Because we solved the manufacturing problem years ago. It's called a compiler. It's called a build system. You take a description of the thing that you want built, you use a formal notation, and boom, you can have as many as you want. Yeah? We solve the manufacturing problem. It's trivial, which leaves us with the other problem, the harder problem, which is exactly what is it that you wanted, and exactly how is it going to do it? We have a different problem, because what people want is they want, they want variation. Because if somebody says, oh, I want that, so that, that software system that you're running, yep, we'd like to have that running over here. Okay, that's easy. We'll just install it over here. We will use the power of the airwaves. And there it is, running. It's done. You know, if one of my kids is using an app and I say, oh, that's pretty cool. What is it? I go, you know, I go to the, go to the app store. I, in other words, it's a solved problem. It just becomes a mere matter of electrons. There's no logistics involved. You go to a restaurant and say, I want what she's having. Either the waiter goes over and grabs what she's having, and everybody's slightly surprised at this, or you have to go to the kitchen and engage in logistics to create something that looks exactly like that. When five of you order the same thing at the table, you expect all five people to get something that looks similar. You don't expect, well, yours looks better than mine, and we ordered the same thing. Elimination of variation, even though we don't consider that necessarily manufacturing. Elimination of variation. In software, that's what we do. If somebody says, I want something that does exactly that in exactly the same way. It's a solved problem. It already exists. My work is done here. Your estimate? Zero. There is zero time involved in achieving this. But people don't ask for that. They ask for, we want something like that, like our competitors got, but we own it. Or it integrates with different products. Or it uses a different implementation technology. Or we want our system but with fewer bugs. They're asking, people are asking for difference. We want our system, but with new features. We want exactly the same system we currently have built in Java. We want it redeveloped in .NET. That's not exactly the same system, is it? People ask for difference. That's the whole thing. That means, if they're asking for difference, it means you haven't got it, which means you probably haven't done it, which means you don't know how to do it. You probably have some great insights, but there's a lot of uncertainty there, and that's fine. You are, but you are working with incomplete knowledge. Every single day, you work with incomplete knowledge, and that's fine. Human beings are great at this. We do this every single day when we get up. You do not know what's going to happen in the day, and you get to the end of the day. Amazing. The problem is when we fool ourselves into thinking that we do know what we're going to do. Yeah, that closes, and that's, this is where the agility comes in, because you need to be able to understand, ah, what we thought is not what was actually happened. So, how does this play into time? Quote from Melvin Conway. 
There's never enough time to do something right, but there's always enough time to do it over. 1968, nice coincidence, different paper. This is the bit that we struggle with. This is the bit that we, as human beings, are not particularly good at. We struggle with time. But we can, we, we've got ways of dealing with this. So let's consider some things. First of all, we don't know everything. We lack all the knowledge that we need. All the knowledge that you need to work on the system that you are working on, whatever capacity you're working on it now, the knowledge that you need to actually do that work is in the future. You don't know enough at this point. Oh, you might think you know, but loosen up a bit. You, know, you probably don't. You'll be wrong. And that's fine. It's just the problem is that unless you've got a time machine, that knowledge that's sitting in the future, the only, we, we as human beings only have one way to get there, and it's called one day at a time. But you get that knowledge by doing it. So therefore, you are going to have a far better idea of what you should be building today, six months from now. So you need to make sure that you've got practices that allow you to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, know, we now know better. Yeah, it's a learning process. That's what learning looks like. So how do we get around it? Well, one of the things is we, we recognize that we have limited capacity. We have a single point of view. If you get a bunch of people together, then potentially you have a far greater intelligence than you individually could provide. Um, so there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. Yeah, in this country, we call that parliament, for example. But there's a point here. And this, this point is actually taken from a, uh, some research that was done um, about 2010-2011, Anita Woolley and Thomas Malone. If a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. Now, there's a few of you in the room that already knew this, but it's less than half. The point that they observed, this is not an effect that they went to look for, but it was a very interesting one, because what they suddenly thought, ah, this is actually representing something about the ways that people communicate. The observation that we can find is that if you are from a, if you end up with a single static demographic for your team, and, I, and I, there's a couple of companies I've done stuff for where it's very noticeable of a particular demographic. So a um, company um, in the northeast of England, they've always recruited graduates from the same three universities, all from computer science courses. Um, they didn't intrinsically need to do computer science, but when looking at the nature of the work, but they ended up with that. Um, another company always recruited from the games industry. And again, they ended up with programmers who were individually excellent, but not necessarily team players. But the biggest disadvantage is they all thought the same. And this other company in the Northeast also discovered that. Oh, we, we're actually not thinking bigger and smarter. We're all thinking the same, which is not really group intelligence, is it? And it just turns out differences in age, differences in regional background, differences in national background, differences in gender, gender identity, differences in pretty much everything, suddenly means you're actually genuinely thinking bigger. You are not all thinking the same. That's the value of this. It's, it's, people keep trying to put very specific terminology on it that sounds business friendly, but it's actually a lot simpler than that. Um, you end up with a monoculture um, that if it happens to be just lined up right, gives you some really good moments. But if it's not lined up right, as a friend of mine discovered when he ran a startup and recruited in his own image, so to speak, you, your failure modes are staggering. How can we make such a big mess? We're all so smart. Turns out a lot of smart people together doesn't actually make a smart outcome necessarily. We're all group thinking our way into the same crappy architecture and the same misunderstanding of the market. So it's just a simple point here. It's just, it, doesn't make, it doesn't make things perfect. It's just that notion of, that's, oh, that's a thing a team can do that an individual can't. Um, we go back um, 20 years, James Sirowicki kind of explored this in The Wisdom of Crowds. And that idea of how do we avoid groupthink, how do we end up with a wise crowd, is the four conditions. Diversity of opinion. Independence, you're able to act independently. This is very difficult for human beings, by the way. We are very social creatures. Decentralization, you're not drawing from the same background, but you've got to put it all together again. Putting it together involves a number of things. That's communication. In fact, literally, it is communication. Communication comes from the word communis, which means together. Okay? So literally, communication is togetherness. 
you are you need to put things together and that is why we are constantly trying to work out what is the role of meetings um, what is the role of slack well it's not on my machine anymore i can tell you that's its role um, if the role of slack is to use up any memory that you haven't already used up that's 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 my understanding of it but the idea is that's why we care about all of these things why it is that email was invented by software developers and all these tools have been invented because it's about how do we communicate that's aggregation that's putting your knowledge together what is a code base a code base is an aggregate piece of knowledge it's, this is where you come to this is my understanding of this bit of the system oh, this is my understanding of how we use this technology it's a collective kind of executable Wikipedia so that kind of gives us a thought here um, Brandon Schwartz captured it very nicely to be a 10x developer be a good developer who helps 10 other people get better at what they do it's the idea that you're, it's about the group intelligence. It is very much about the, the forgotten side, if you like, um, of this stuff. Um, this has been quoted, and, quoted to death, in fact. And people often forget to read it, slowly. But one of the most interesting things is this one. Um, we forget this because that's the bit that makes it work. That's the bit that, that Agile development was originally interested about. It was not interested in certification schemes. It was not in, interested in the tooling that you use. These days when you ask people, oh, okay, what are you doing? Oh, we're doing Agile development. Okay, tell me about it. What you normally get is a shopping list of process certifications and tools. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, we've all gone on a Scrum certification course and we're using Jira for this. And this. You get a shopping list of all of this. I'm not saying you don't need it, this stuff doesn't run on magic, but that's the bit that actually matters. And we seem to have neglected that. We've come uh, there's been a rather interesting full cycle. So that reminds us that we should not be obsessed with this idea of speed. So I'll kind of close with one of the other bits. Responding to change over following a plan. People often kind of like, let's, let's actually understand what that really, really means. <laughs> because we don't know the future. That's fine. Every single day we are able, as individual human beings, to negotiate that. Um, we often have a plan of what we're going to do. We have an idea of things. That's great. And then we either adapt and respond to changing the situation, or we fail to do that and live a life of delusion and surprise. Okay, so it's this bit, this bit. So we started off with the whole point. It's not about the velocity. It turns out it's about this. It's about the rate at which you can change your velocity. It's not about the raw speed. You, maybe you can measure that in certain cases. And maybe we also look at the direction, but what's interesting is your ability to go, oh, that's not going to work out. Change of direction is a change of acceleration. Okay, A change of speed is also involves acceleration. Okay, All of these things are basically saying we are changing our velocity. It's not about having a high velocity in terms of magnitude. It's the ability to make a change when it turns out that things don't line up perfectly, that there is a bit of a surprise. As one company I know discovered, it's just, and as a number of companies have recently discovered, when large companies close off their APIs and your whole product line, your value add, is reliant on, oh, we value add on this. We are, we're using, oh, that Amazon API that's disappeared, that Twitter API that seems to have morphed into something less useful, that all of this stuff, then it's the rate of change that matters. We need to change direction. When the licensing agreements on certain products that you are using turns out to be unfavorable. When you discuss all of these things are outside of your control. When there is a pandemic, when you know, your team make up changes, when your organization is bought out by another one, all of these things, but also when we actually discover what we wanted because we've now built it. All of these things are sources of change. Change is just normal. So therefore this turns out to be the greatest ability. Um, and when we look at it from that point of view, that gives us a very different Kind of perspective. So I will close with an observation from the artist Austin Cleon. Um, this is targeted at people in creative professions. He's written a number of really good books. And I tend to think that 
Software development is one of the most creative professions existing. We actually genuinely create something from nothing. Okay? Um, but he puts it down to this. It's impossible to pay proper attention to your life if you are hurtling along at lightning speed. When your job is to see things other people don't, and that is, no matter what capacity you have within software development, it is your job to see things that other people have missed. Sometimes it's the details. Sometimes it's the big picture. Sometimes it is the small picture. Sometimes it's to notice something and go, wait a minute, that's going to cause us a problem now in the future, or that's what's been causing us a problem in the past. You spot something, and that changes the way that things will flow from now if you react to it. You have to slow down enough. You can actually look. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>